Okay, so today, uh, I think I mentioned yesterday I was going to probably upload a Fire Emblem video today. So today I'm going to talk about um, Camilla and like the general anchoring position and, and stuff like that. So I had that video uh, talking about the defense, the Aether, the Aether Rays defense um, team, uh, the flyer ball and all that stuff. But today I want to talk about specifically the um, the anchoring position and, and Camilla and her purpose and, and uh, what's going on with that. So... Yeah, so let's just kind of get into it. Um, so first of all, this is what my Camilla is right now. So let's take a look at her. She's right here. Uh, on the side, you see kind of like like what she... Like the just the end version of, of what she is. And um, just the only difference is going to be the Fury 4. Uh, but that's, you know... So that's sort of what I what I want her to be at the, at the end point. Iceberg is there. Uh, I might run, you know, I've been... Contemplating between Iceberg and Glacies and all that stuff, um, but for the most part, this build is is pretty much what it is. Now, I want to point out here uh, the negative synergy that works with uh, Fury and Guard, uh, because Fury drops you by six uh, and it drops you out of Guard range. Um, there's there's some negative synergy there, so I want to uh, address that. And she she doesn't have the uh, the I O shield because my my um, What's her name? My Boki's using that right now because we're in light season, so I'm using her. Um, but yeah, so normally I just kind of pay attention to the one on the left because this is this is what she like the end game of this version of her uh, should be. Um, but yeah, so like I said, so I want to address like sort of there's a negative synergy here between the guard and the fury. Now the idea is this this guard here is at the start of combat. So at the start of combat. Um, when they first hit, so if like if someone moves uh, to this position here, or you know here or here, you know whatever, the first turn will be someone will try to attack her, or bait her out somewhere. Let's just see if we can or bait her out by standing here and here, right? So that's something I want to. There's a point there that like on the first initiation, the first battle, the guard is going to work. Now the question, of course, becomes: Well, the guard isn't, or not not necessarily the question, but the point is that eventually. Uh, after the first initiation or the second initiation, uh, the guard's going to be useless. But I think for the most part, the reason I had this set up this way is because the guard isn't wholly useful outside of the first turn. Um, the first turn is really where it, it, it is the most important thing because once we're getting into turn two and turn three and uh, stuff starts moving out of position, if you lose, it's not because the guard wasn't triggering at that point. If you lose, it's because things didn't go the way they should have gone in terms of positioning. Your unit sort of splayed out, maybe. Um, so there's a lot of other things. Like, worrying about past the first turn is a little bit... Um, you get kind of diminishing returns on your uh, concern for that. Um, but yeah, so... That's kind of a point to make there. Now let's take a look at. I've been. I haven't locked this team in yet, as you can see, because uh, the blessings are all over the place here. Um, and I'm probably going to lock it in at some point uh, now because she's at a plus five, and I'll probably wait till I get enough feathers to get the final plus ten before I unlock it and then make those changes. But, um, but yeah, so this team isn't locked in, and, and one of the reasons it's not locked in yet is mainly because of something to do with Camilla. So let's see if I can switch. So I've been thinking about running this on Camilla, right? Because I, like I said, I am aware of the the fact that the guard isn't working, but I think like what there is a certain hesitance to run something like this on her uh, because the uh, because it it takes a lot of her kill potential away. Um, when you're on defense, you don't always want to just like like even your even your tank, right? Like this is the main, like I said, this is the anchoring position, the main tank position. Uh, even her in this position, you don't want her to. I think I, I might have moused over. Ignore this. Uh, I'm, this is I'm grinding out a HM with him, so I'm, this is, makes it easier. But that the death blow should be there later. Um, but having those extra stats to not just her defense. So let's yeah. So not to not just her defense. I think she has it on her. You're getting a plus six here. You're losing three stats, and you're reallocating them to attack and speed. Uh, on Camilla by running Fury. Uh, so both of them get you the same stat bonus. Well, actually, you lose two on attack and speed because of the other one, so you're losing a lot more. Um, but the point is, you, like, 40 speed is pretty good along with, you know, the 51 uh, the fifty one attack. But it comes down to, like, 
a debate with yourself of do you want her to have any kill potential at all and i think problematically the fortress res defense takes away a lot of her kill potential uh because for one now she can't double of two she's going to get doubled more often uh which means that like the fortress res defense is, is almost losing you tanking this in that essence um and yeah so she 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 it becomes harder for her to kill things and easier for her to get doubled which inevitably leads you to getting hit more um so that this is why it's something that's i'm sort of hesitant to put on her uh conversely so like i said there's a negative synergy between these two i could replace this with something else there's that new uh what is that guard bearing or something that new skill that came out on that flyer that makes it so that uh it reduces damage on the first initiation by 50 percent um on the first uh combat by 50 percent or something like that uh, but that only works in the first combat, and again, so that, that's serving a similar purpose to the guard, where the guard is mostly only going to work during the first combat. Mm -hmm. But at least with the guard, you're getting one more combat out, because they'll attack you once, you'll have the guard up and all that stuff. So when they attack you the second time, uh, your health your health will be low enough so that guard is no longer useful. So if that happens, then she was going to die, I think, regardless, whether the guard was active during both uh, both attacks. Uh, if they're confident enough to attack her once and then dance and then attack again or maybe put another unit there to attack um, Then she's gonna die anyway, so that's kind of one of the the, the, the points I want to make there uh, But the fact that like I have a healing tower here makes it so that when their turn starts a guard is triggered again And I cannot worry about it as much uh, especially now. This is this season in uh, What is this one? This one's uh, in uh, uh, dark season. Yeah uh, in dark season because I have Leanne and this healing tower, uh, the idea is that it basically helps her, helps keep her topped off a little more uh, than normal. Especially in both seasons, uh, I'm running uh, Micaiah, and Micaiah has a tendency to go and uh, use Sacrifice on somebody, which again puts her over that threshold again. Uh, so I think, you know, for the most part, having the Fury build is really a little more beneficial, which is what I think I'm going to ultimately go with. Um, in that sense but it's i want to point out that it's sort of an option you can go for uh just you know you want to make sure you understand um what you're losing in this sense and then in, in this sense you're losing yeah in this sense you're losing a lot of attacks so if we take a look at those two builds uh fury 4 gets you to 50 58 57 without the fury 4 um, but with the Fortress Res Defense, you're only hitting 52 attack, and you're losing a, a pretty serious amount of speed, so you're going to get doubled a lot more. Um, so that's kind of a point, and that's why I want to sort of draw attention to Ashnard here. So for those of you who watch a lot of my videos, a lot of my uh, Aether Raid stuff, because that's the main thing I put out for, for this, and even if you watch the, the Epic 7 stuff, like you'll hear me do a lot of like... I hesitate to call it complaining, because like, I don't feel that's what it is, but I, I, I feel you would be justified if you were to uh, assess what I, what the, some of the stuff I say as complaining. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't disagree with you necessarily if you say that. Uh, but I, I don't say, I don't point a lot of that stuff out necessarily to to complain or to just, like, feel miserable for myself. A lot of the times I, I point these things out uh, so that people know playing this game uh, what sort of things you're going to face. So I, I kind of try to point out, like, flaws or things that are going bad or, or faults and all that stuff not necessarily to point out the faults so much as to give people warnings so if you hear me complaining about felicia it's sort of to accentuate or more make more clear the problems you're going to face if you yourself decide to uh build a felicia and invest in her and you know and all that stuff so like i said like my channel i try to like educate um to some degree obviously i'm not i'm no accurate so like i said um go check out his channel for more uh, what I think is, is higher quality um, material and all that stuff. But I, I like to educate to some degree uh, what I can. And the thing about Acris is he, he, he focuses a lot more on efficiency than preference. And I like to focus on preference and then building around what makes that work. Um, so like I said, so in, in that sense, that's what that is. So that's why I want to talk about Ashnard here. Because if you're looking at this purely from a functional and competitive uh, point of view... I really do think Ashnard is, is one of, if not the best anchoring uh, units for this position that I'm talking about here. As you can see that build on the left, on the right, I mean, uh, it, it's pretty it's pretty meaty. Um, he's got 60 attack, which even with Camilla running her Fury 4, blows her attack out of the water, basically. Uh, his bulk also basically destroys her with a 10 more defense. 
uh, and two more resistance. On top of the fact that he has Gurgarant, Gurgarant, whatever you want to call it, I'm not entirely sure how to say that. Uh, he has Gurgarant, which has the, um, what's the word, the the IO shield built into it, which means that in the, you know, he can make up for the fact, so Camilla loses a lot of kill potential, not only because her damage gets lowered from the uh, Fortress Res defense, but also because she she can't double. Now, she loses tankiness because she'll get doubled, but Ashnard here can usually take doubles and give doubles back because of the quick repost. And because you're not running a fury on him, his HP generally will stay a lot higher so he can be healed by either, you know, Micaiah when he needs to or the healing tower. And like I said, uh, if you're running uh, Leanne, which is, is generally a good choice for a flyer bomb, uh, you're getting health from that. So basically he'll, he'll almost always be in guard and quick repost. But on, additionally, his Gurgarant effect reduces their enemies within two spaces during combat passively reduces their attack and defense by five, which makes them one more physically vulnerable to things like um, to things like Minerva here if you're running her or things like uh, Pala. So in my team specifically, having Ashnard here and then get making your units tankier by reducing their attack by five again. Uh, which isn't, which also isn't counting the the five reduction that they might get from this, and then the dance, uh, one of these reduces minus three, so that's already minus eight to attack and all those other um, penalties and whatnot. Um, so yeah, so not, and then on top of that, you've got the minus seven here from this plus the minus five defense, so that's minus twelve defense on a basic level. Uh, so yeah, so I want to point out here that if you are if you if you're sort of uh, uncaring as to like. The preference for units or you know you, you don't care about like waifus and you just you're just here to be good at the game i really do think ashnard is the best for this position he he just blows camille out of the water in terms of stats and anything else you could put on him uh like his hey his hp is higher again he doubles for 60 he's a red check so you can fight against you know greens like he has a your team will have a better time again like like i said you've got the you know you want the rgb here so the fact that i have two greens is sort of a detriment but you can put the red here um, and that, that sort of fixes a lot of your problems. Now, you know, Urban Ike is still, it's still going to be hard to kill him, but, um, you'll have an easier time because you have such a strong red there and, and, uh, baiting him out is going to be a lot harder for the enemy. Um, but yeah, so one of the major justifications I use personally for running Camilla, uh, on my team, let's go back to the, uh, my regular build, uh, for running Camilla on my team is going to be the Camilla's Axe. Which gives her not only her um, plus four attack and speed, um, therefore boosting her to like sixty something. But you know, again, that's whatever. Um, also gives my uh, uh, friendly units attack and speed. Um, so she's a ball of stats that she gives everybody. But I think that's not necessarily that. It's not that important because, like I said, Ashnar doesn't give people passive. Uh, buffs the way Camilla does, but he makes enemies within two spaces. He passively uh, debuffs them, which is kind of similar, right? So buffing your your own units or debuffing the enemy units, it's it's kind of it's almost interchangeable. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of what I like about Camilla. For one, the speed I do value it quite a lot. Um, but yeah, so if you would ask me if I were to just sort of you know pretend like I didn't already invest in Camilla and I didn't make that decision, I, I think Ashnard is the best way to go. Uh, I'm personally not going to build an Ashnard because, I mean, look at him. I don't really like him that much. He looks kind of whatever. Um, and I don't play, like I said, I, I haven't played a single Fire Emblem game. So I don't have any attachment to these characters. To me, they're just like skins, basically. Uh, and of course, I do like Camilla and her art a lot more, a lot more, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of, this is what, you know, basically this, this, let's see if I can switch this here. What's going on here? So these are two different builds. Um, I just wanted to show on the right here. If we look at uh, Ashnard, uh, I think this is probably one of your stronger builds because he's already got enough bulk, and you don't have to worry about you know adding more um, stats to him. Uh, he gets the doubles, the quick repose doubles, and uh, the bonfire is going to hit for quite a bit considering his huge um, defense stat, as well as working on um, having guard and not have to worry about specials. Uh, another one. Oh, that's the wrong one. Okay, another build maybe you could even maybe you could even run Fury on him with the Quick Repost, um, 
and put something else in there. But again, like the quick repost and the fury kind of have negative synergy because you lose uh, the fury is dropping you HP and the quick repost you need to be over a certain uh, threshold to, for it to trigger. Um, but like here's another example where if you if you get rid of the guard, you can put the quick repost in the slot in the B slot, and then your um, seal is open to whatever you want to put. Um, just the fact that Gergarant has the the IO shield built into it. Um, heavily like opens up his build possibilities because now you're not having to worry about where you know am I running IO shield in the A slot am I running it in the seal uh, what's going on with that it's already built into the weapon so you don't really have to worry about that um, so yeah uh, in terms of like again so in terms of uh, like specifically the anchoring position um, you could also consider uh, you know doing swapping this here putting her like that uh, having her in this anchoring position as well. Um, what is that? Oh, uh, but yeah. So Minerva is pretty good, right? Because a lot of the threats you're going to run into are going to be um, very f physical threats in terms of um, their effect on the on the on the uh, on the team. So you you fight a lot of daggers, a lot of um, a lot of bows. Gale Force uh, armor units a lot of times, um, but yeah. So a lot of and then a lot of the magical threats are kind of they tend to be a lot of blue threats. Uh, so fortunately, you have greens to sort of counteract that. Um, so if you uh, I talked about uh, Acarus is 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 version of this uh, in my older in my other video talking about just the the flyer ball in general. In terms of the anchor position, he has um, Minerva here just because she she, she does so well uh, at tanking in general. Um, she can actually like she can take hits from whatever you want to throw at her. And like I said, she's already got for one she's got the uh, the minus one charge the the guard on her weapon already built in with basically a Fury Four here if they're at full health. Um, and then on top of that, she has the Dragoon Shield. Which takes, you know, it's IO Shield plus a Fury 3 minus the res. So I think she's a very good position. She's a very good unit to have here in this position. Um, you just need to be wary and sort of counteract the uh, res weakness she has because it's, it's a really, it's a very big weakness. Now, I, uh, one way to counteract that it would probably be to maybe, uh, maybe drop uh, Duma here and then run uh, two Mirabilises or something. Um, which would be like excessively irritating for the enemy team, right? So when you, whenever, I mean, I think we all hate playing against uh, dual, dual dancing teams just because they're annoying to, to play against most of the time. Uh, but having, in this case, having two uh, Mirabilises benefits her uh, like a huge amount because it really helps patch up that, uh, that very low res. So I, as you can see on the left there, that's a plus 10. Mine's currently a plus 5. So her res stat's going to be a lot lower. And then this one doesn't count in the. Um, the Mirabilis uh, blessing buffs. So if we take a look on the left, having a second Mirabilis there boosts her res up to 34 with the uh, attack res bond, which again, we're kind of thinking about the anchoring position and and first turn interactions. Uh, so we want to discourage them attacking us. So they won't really attack it. It'll be harder for them to attack into us with a uh, 39, what is that? Uh, yeah, 39 res um, Minerva there. Uh, that's not that's not that's also not counting like uh that ward and this well she's uh, she's not gonna have a ward uh maybe this ward and and you know this ward or, or this goat or whatever so it's not counting uh these stats which i don't count in just because again having like these right here are flexible so i i'm reserving like let's just wait i'll, I'll wait and see how this works out uh and if they you know if it turns out that I, they, they get killed too easily then i'll just switch them all to wards uh, if it turns out that maybe I'm losing because I'm not securing kills and maybe I need more goads, right? So that's something, again, for, for your own teams, you really want to consider that. Uh, as you can see there, I had the blue flame. Uh, I'm still, again, when it comes to like the, the, the goad or the ward as well as the specials, it comes down to a lot of like tweaking, you know. Are you looking at your defenses and are you seeing that she would have gotten off a lot more um, blue flames if it was a two cooldown special? Um or are you seeing that maybe if you have a two cooldown special now, maybe you're not securing kills, in which case maybe waiting that extra turn for that, you know, bigger damage boost is more worth it. So again, it all comes down to, you know, 
these things uh, take a lot of tweaking. Um, but when it comes to this other, you know, these other points here, you you know, they're more locked in, uh, at least for me anyway. Uh, but yeah, so specials and these are going to take time to figure out, you know, the proper balance between the two. Um, so I want to also address one last thing here, uh, kind of in relation to this anchoring position, is the fact that I have Duma on this team. Um, so Duma's uh, uh, S, uh, his, his S, yeah, I'm playing uh, Epic 7. Uh, Duma's uh, C slot skill here uh, deals 7 damage to everybody. Um, you might, you know, you might say that this is negative synergy with um, Minerva because she needs the enemy to be at full HP. But I think that that's sort of, that's, I kind of like the way that interacts, right? So either you drop everybody by seven and seven is no laughing matter. It, it, it can often be the, the difference between uh, a unit living and a unit dying in an interaction uh, or an engagement, I, I should say. Um, but seven HP is, is, is nothing to like disregard in terms of how much damage they're taking. It's not like, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna cripple them with a seven HP, um, seven HP blast like that. But you're certainly going to leave them, um, you know, that much weaker. Uh, but yeah, so either there's two situations: either they keep that seven damage and they move around, you know, according to whatever they're gonna do, right? Or they end up healing it with like, you know, Leanne, I've seen some Leannes on offense, not a lot of them, but you know, Leanne, or they run their healers, or they have the healing tower and all that stuff, right? So there's two possibilities, either they leave that damage there, or they heal up. So if they heal up, there's really no worries, right? Because then, you know, she'll have all her boosts and everything, her weapon will be triggered and all that stuff, uh, which is fine, right? So, you know, that, that's a good thing. Uh, if they don't heal up, not only does it, you know, does that make them weaker so that they take more, you know, there's a higher chance, like seven more points of damage worth of a chance to to destroy, uh, to defeat their units. But also, uh, it boosts Duma a little bit because now his weapon is triggered. Uh, so it kind of also, not only does it make him tankier because now they can't follow up attack unless they got a uh, uh, Null C Disrupt or something like that. Um, but it also just makes him a lot stronger because now he's got more res and more attack. Um, but yeah, so I think for me, like what I the the, the point I want to uh, stress here is in this situation with the Duma versus the Dragoon Axe, um, it's sort of a win-win regardless. Either they leave that damage on them and the Dragoon Axe doesn't trigger, um, then you still you know you still have plenty of kill potential is what I'm saying. Uh, especially because if as you can see my setup here. Uh, Minerva is not in the anchoring position so to go like no one's gonna go out of their way to go hit Minerva after they got upheaval damage just because oh her her special is not gonna trigger right I mean they might I'm not saying this you know it's not this is not always 100% they might uh, but if they do go after Minerva they're sort of you, you'll be so far out of position in that case that you know basically it becomes an easier um, cleanup for everyone else um, but yeah so like I said I, I, I don't mind that sort of almost trade-off, as you can say, because in that case, um, either Duma gets his weapon at full potential or Dragoon X gets to be at full potential. So either one or the other is good. Um, of course, you know, sometimes, you know, it would be ideal to have both, right? But uh, yeah, like I said, there is sort of a negative synergy there. But a lot of times I use Minerva and like you fight against Minerva's and whether or not they're at, a, you, you don't really want to go into a team like a flyer ball and say maybe uh, bait here or here or put him here and then have, you know, try to hit him or hit her or something like that. You don't really want to go into that with anything less than full HP um, as an attacker. Uh, maybe if you could move there and then try to trigger the hardy bearing or not the hardy bearing, the, the vantage, I'm already getting ahead of myself there. Uh, if you want to find, you know, hope, like sometimes the 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 upheaval helps trigger the the vantage a little easier. Uh, but I think if, if you're gonna trigger the vantage, you're gonna do it regardless, like like whether or not the upheaval is there. So I think that that situation sort of you can not worry about that. But like I said, either you're gonna want to bait them here and this position, but you don't have to worry too much, right? Because you've got Hardy bearing Pala to to deal with that. Um, but yeah, so. That's kind of that's a point I wanted to stress in that sense. Um, I'm not too bothered by it because my main tank is going to be Camilla at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, so 
that's sort of a I just wanted to point out here something um, regarding Camilla and her build is that I think ultimately I'm just gonna stick with the uh, the fury because it, it's you're losing way too much uh, damage potential now like I said granted um, you do really want this anchor to be more tanky than damage oriented but I think you're, you're sacrificing too much and again these are these are like I'm not like again th this could be seen as me sort of complaining about Camilla um, but the point isn't that I'm complaining about her because she's bad or, or, or so on and so forth. It's sort of letting you know these are the things you have to think about uh, if you decide to build a flyer ball and you decide to use Camilla as that position. Uh, whereas if you were less stubborn or, or more open to just being, you know, what the word, what's the word, like purely optimal, you would run something like uh, an Ashnard because he's just so oppressively good at what he does and which is just tanking um yeah so i mean the lack of speed isn't that big a deal because again you can just run quick repost uh if they got no c disrupt then you know i guess you're kind of screwed there but that's you know, it's neither here nor there um so basically he's got you know 50 defense let's go back to the uh, another build i kind of i like this one's decent but i like this one a lot more um because of like i said you get the guard for one uh the fortress res defense boosts his stats like crazy uh, and then you get the quick repose, which gives him the double. But not only does he have 50 defense and 47 res, he basically has 55 defense and 52 res because the Gurgenrant sword drops their the enemy's attack by um, by five uh, within two spaces, which you can't really hit him outside of two spaces. So you know he's always going to have that there. Uh, but yeah, so like I said, this is a, a, a video mainly addressing certain things with Camilla. Uh, certain worries that might come up or, or sort of catch-alls there uh, as well as uh, sort of being information in terms of like your own build and and letting people know that Ashnard is, is just a, a better choice overall and you know I guess finally um, understanding that uh, Minerva herself makes a pretty decent um, anchoring tank but again depending like this position here makes a lot of things um, changes a lot of things because now if you have Minerva there you need to conf you need to figure out whether or not you want to run two Mirabilises um, because not only will that be better uh, in general because you'll have two Mirabilises on your team for for one dancing for two that's a plus 10 res which helps patch up her, her poor res stat and for three you're not running um, Duma you're not running Duma which means that your axe should always trigger on most of the units right because they'll they'll probably hit her or she'll hit them at 100% HP um, but yeah on top of that uh, you want to consider like for me what like if you were to do this and put the Mirabilis here you really need to cons this this secondary slot here and this slot here become that much more important right now I can kind of slack off on the way uh, these two stats here because Duma and Pala hold a lot of my kill potential in their uh, units, in their stats, and in their in their skills. So it's not that big a deal um, that maybe she's not as triggered or or she's not as triggered here or she's not as effective here because I'm running a lot. Of, I'm trying to like patch up some of the the the, the shortcomings with just having a, a whole lot more kill potential. Um, but once, let, let's say, if you were to remove Duma and put another dancer here, these two suddenly, like like this, these two. So, I mean, obviously, you're not gonna run Camilla because, like I said, Camilla's for this position. Uh, I mean, you guess you could if you wanted to, but you know, I wouldn't at that point. Um, but these two become infinitely more valuable because now you're losing a lot of kill potential that you're from Duma, and you're putting it on their shoulders. Uh, if you're running Pala again, uh, I mentioned this in the last one, the Est. Um, if you're running Est, you can, you know. She can be this position instead, and, and you can build something else. But you really do need to focus on these. So you can't run Minerva. You can't say run Minerva and then run Ashnard in this position. Because Ashnard, again, he's a good tank, but he doesn't have a lot of kill con kill confirm potential. Um, so you really need to start calculating that stuff. The way it's set up now, uh, Camilla in the Sanker position does a good job of tanking. I mean, she's not the best. Obviously, Ashnard here on the, on the right um, shows us that. But something that uh is pretty good about minerva is she does have a decent amount of kill potential considering how high her attack is with her speed with her um special acceleration um and a lot of these a lot of these uh you know wards and goads alongside of her 
Um, so my kill potential is basically focused on them. And then Minerva is also pretty good as well. But she's not like super drastic the way, uh, you know, a Pala or a Duma might be. And then obviously these two, like Micaiah, again, she's here mainly for the ground orders as well as the, uh, the Yoon's Whisper. As well as just being a good res tank as well as um, checking armors and calves even though um, even though she might not do that good a job of it because she, she tends to sacrifice a lot uh, and she doesn't actually like I don't know she, she, she tends to not do a whole lot so if there's a tank there I usually end up losing anyway um, especially because she's missing flyer formation because I, I have to give it to her uh, she's missing flyer formation, so like, if they put a tank here, like I lost to a Naga, no, a Nagi, that green, uh, the green dragon tank, not not Sothis, uh, but because she couldn't reach, so she couldn't like stand here and then just hit her, which would have been good, right? So like, that's why what makes this this position here so much better. Um, but yeah, so. Ultimately, it's going to take a lot of uh, tweaking. Like, if I get another go, and I'm, I'm sort of talking about just the Aether Raids uh, map in general. Anyway, but yeah, so let's go back to um, the main point here. Uh, Camilla, Fury, uh, Fury's negative synergy with uh, Guard, uh, I don't consider it to be too big a deal. Um, as well as uh, just, you, you know, losing too much kill potential off of the lack of Fury. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if you really, like, if one of these two is really bad, then maybe you replace this with, with like I said, you know, you could go with the Fortress Res defense here and not be too bad. Um, or you could just replace Guard with something else. Uh, there's just not a whole lot. Like I said, that that um, Guard bearing or something would be pretty decent. Um, but yeah, so I value the ability to, to take out units uh, with some frequency a little higher than absolutely being unable to die. Um, so I think that's okay to have uh, Camilla the way she is in that sense. Uh, but yeah, so I think after this, the next time I make a video about this, I think the next video I was going to make is going to be on, um, my Felicia now that she's done, uh, talk about, you know, her build and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Um, and her position, her role and all that, you know, just basically the full package there. Um, but yeah, so... For those of you out there, uh, let this be sort of, hopefully this is informative in terms of like what things you'll face using Camilla and, and uh, why you should just go with Ashnard uh, if you care about um, efficiency. But yeah, so sort of rambled on for quite a bit here, but hopefully um, this has been decently clear, a bit rambly, sure, but uh, decently clear. Uh, but yeah, so like I said, uh, maybe Thursday there'll probably be a video about the Felicia and, and going forward. Uh, I might, I don't think, I don't think everybody goes this far into the videos, but, uh, I might start doing, like, maybe unit reviews of, not, like, build reviews or anything, but, like, like, as new units come out, sort of talking about, um, talking about summoning, uh, whether or not, like, you know, basically, uh, summon or, or not summon, uh, sort of analyzing the units and whatnot, um, I like the position I'm in currently. Uh, I don't have to summon for any more units. I'm basically done. I mean, I'd like her um, because she'll basically complete my uh, my Aether. Well, she won't. Like, my Aether Raid's defense team is complete, but she'll definitely be a huge boon where I can replace this green here with a red mage, which will definitely uh, help me out, especially just because, like I said, I'm missing a red threat. Um, very much I'm missing a red threat. Um, so, you know, having her there, especially because she has ground orders, um, and if, for, for those of you who don't know her interaction, because she has basically the creator sword effect on her book, you can run wind sweep on her, uh, and she can just attack people without getting counterattacked, which is ridiculous. Um, but yeah, anyway, like I said, maybe I can, like, make some more videos, depending on, you know, if, if anybody wants to see something like that. Uh, but I may, might may make those, like, later when, you know, I've got more rapport. Right now, obviously, as you guys can see... Uh, I've been struggling in uh, Aether Rays from time to time. Like, if I can get into... Like, I can make it into um, Tier 27 pretty consistently, sometimes, anyway. Um, but I really want to lock that down more, more like a guarantee, where it's like, yeah, I'll be in Aether Rays Tier 27 every week. Um, and I think, for one, now that my Astra season is basically... Um, basically complete, because now I have the Broadleaf Fan Felicia... Um, 
going forward, I think uh, both seasons will be pretty good. Um, so long as like nothing too bad happens. And then especially because my Aether, my Aether Raid's defense here should be better. I think this is better. Um, but, you know, again, testing and all that stuff, we'll see how that turns out. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, hopefully uh, if there's any questions or anything, uh, just leave a comment. Um, at least, you know, better better now than later when uh, I get, you know, there ends up being too many comments to go through. Uh, but yeah, that's a little bit for today.